You're listening to the Finding Christ in the Old Testament series, preaching by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24 this morning. And this will be the last message from the book of 2 Samuel. Samuel. We'll finish this series, and then we will, next week, Lord willing, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm I'm looking forward to getting back to the New Testament just for a time, eventually making it back this way. 2 Samuel chapter 24 this morning. Let's look at the text. We'll be reading most of the chapter, and I hope that you have taken the time this week to look over this text. It's packed. It is certainly packed. Starting verse number 1, and listen closely. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people how many soever they be, an hundredfold, and that the eyes of my lord the king may see it. But why doth my lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. And verse 5 says they passed over the Jordan. He tells us where they went. Verse number 8 So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. We're now talking of an army of 1.3 million men. It's a powerhouse. Verse 10, and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things, choose thee, one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I'm in a great strait. Let us fall now unto the hand of the Lord for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. When the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It's enough. Stay now thy hand. The angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arana, the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up. Rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aaron the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Arana looked and saw the king and the servants coming toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my Lord come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, 
Here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arana as a king give unto the king. And Arana said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. The king said unto Arana, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. This is the word of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Uh, chapter 24 is full, um, it's teeming full of, of truth about the character of God and the nature of man. And in this chapter, some 25 verses, there are some huge theological questions that arise. And the challenge for me this morning, at least, is that we don't miss the forest for the trees. There are times that we as people love to focus on the nuances of doctrine, and doctrine is important. But we've got to be careful that these doctrinal issues don't become hobby horses and that we may have the right answers, but wrong living. I want you this morning, and I want myself this morning, as we go through this chapter, to highlight some of these issues, but I, I don't want you to miss the main theme. And the main theme always from Genesis through Revelation is the proclamation of the gospel and gospel living. You may say, wait a minute, we're in the Old Testament. How can that be? Well, listen, here's what Jesus said in John chapter 5, before the New Testament was ever written. His Bible was the Old Testament. And here's what he said, search the scriptures, the Old Testament. Check them out. Why? Because they testify of me. And as we read the word of God, it's important for all of us, as we read, to look for Christ, to see Christ to see him, his attributes, his character, his sacrifice, his love, his mercy, and his grace. And so, this morning, that's what we'll attempt to do, but we've got to work through some things. We'll talk this morning quickly, and I'm sure it will not satisfy your curiosity, sovereignty, and human responsibility. We'll talk about the sins of the flesh and the sins of the spirit, and then we'll close with the supreme lesson of this chapter, which I believe to be, Mercy, mercy. Verse number one of our text this morning, if you'll join me again, look there. Verse one starts, and it's somewhat strange. He says in verse number one, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And, and what's interesting as this chapter starts out is that the author of Second Samuel, whether it was Gad the prophet or Nathan the prophet, never tells us why the Lord is angry. He just doesn't say. He, he really doesn't answer that question for us. Um, now, we can guess, and I think we can become pretty close on why this is. We've been going through the study, and I think, and I could be wrong, but I think this has something to do with a nation who previously, before this time, completely rejected God and his anointed king, There was an uprising through Absalom, and the military ousted God's covenant king and had a rejection of God and his kingdom. I think that's what's happening, but we don't know. And the author doesn't deem it necessary that we do know, which is interesting to me. But then he says this. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, against the nation, And the Lord moved David to number the people. Now, you might not think that's a big deal. But in the numbering of the people, we'll find later on, as we read this morning already, that there's some sin that happens with David, and David is held responsible. And yet we find that in this text, the Lord is the one who moves David. Still with me this morning? It's just early, I know, but we're still hanging there, okay? Let me just open that, instead of going through a litany of, of, of 
reasons or answers. Here's what the Hebrew mind thinks, and here's how they think. This is by Walter Kaiser. He says this, whatever God permits, he commits. Whatever God allows, he is the sovereign king of the universe. He is in complete control. Whatever God permits, he commits. By allow By allowing the census taking, God is viewed as having brought about the act. The Hebrews were not very concerned with determining secondary causes and properly attributing them to the exact cause. Under the divine providence, everything ultimately was attributed to him. Why not say that he did it in the first place? And so for the Hebrew mind, David is moved, David does this, but ultimately they understand that God is sovereign, God is in control, he rules the world and the universe, and so they say, listen, just that you know, this is what God did. We not, we're not concerned about secondary causes or, or whatever, God is in charge, God is sovereign, he's in control, okay? That's the sovereignty of God. And we would say this morning, I believe as the people who know the word of God, absolutely, Right? I would and two other guys. But that's, it's yes. The answer is yes. God is sovereign. But look at verse number 10. After David does this act, in verse number 10, and David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people, and David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done, and now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And David now, who would believe that God is sovereignly in control, not even understanding what happened here, says, listen, I understand I am responsible for my actions. He doesn't pull a Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, right? Some of you older generations would understand that, young generation have no idea what I'm talking about. He didn't blame God. He said, listen, I understand that what I did was sinful. And so here's the question this morning, that this text brings us to a, a point and a head. Is God sovereign? Is man responsible? And the answer is yes. It is yes. God is sovereign. And man is responsible. Listen to what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, speaking about this topic. Both are true, and what we have to do is to believe them both. Now, that bothers some of us because we sit here and we want God to explain to us and to justify for us what he says and what he does. And so we sit in judgment of him saying, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't connect. This is a mystery. And I want all the answers. And so that statement that you've got to believe both troubles us. We were in our home study group this last week, and we have a great group. It's, 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 it's very diverse. We have folks in our group who are just, they have newborn babies, and we have others who have newborn grandbabies, and so it's a real nice group. And we talked about the topic of suffering this last week. And one of the young men in our group who is fully aware of suffering, tragic suffering, sat there, and as he listened, as we spoke, he said this, God is God. He doesn't owe me an explanation. If he wants me to know, he would tell me. I must simply trust him. I thought that was powerful from this young man. Understanding that God is sovereign, we are responsible, he is in control, and some of these things are mysterious to us. And the problem for many of us is we want God in our nice little box. We want to package him so that we have all the answers about the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke this world into existence from nothing. We want to say, yep, I've got him figured out. He fits in my little box. Or we want to refuse what he says about himself. Listen, God is not what you think he is. God is what he says he is. Period. Period. And, and we are men and we are women. We are finite. He is God. And I find in our lives that we brandish an arrogance when it comes to worship. To worship. If God doesn't fit in our box or we don't like what he says, then we become the judges of the creator of the universe. We're arrogant. When Pastor Dan and I made this trip to Dominican, we left here at 4 in the morning. He made me a nice cup of coffee. 
We were on the road. We got to the airport in London, and at 5, we had a muffin and took off for Porta Plata. Uh, we landed about 1, and on those cheap flights, there's nothing to drink. There's nothing to eat. You have to pay for it, and we're, he's really Dutch. We pay for nothing. <laughs> okay. And so we land at the airport, and we got out uh, on that day. It was probably by this time 1, 2 o'clock, 95 degrees or so. You know, and, and when people say that, I don't understand this. Well, it's a dry heat. No, it's hot. It's really hot. And it was hot. Once you're at the airport, you can't get back in. And so we sat there, and uh, we were waiting for our vehicle, which we, we didn't know we'd have to wait for three hours because of culture and some complication with the vehicle. And so we ate lunch that day together. We split a, a can of Pringles and two Cokes. They were delicious. Never tasted better. But as we sat there, we just started to people watch. I got to tell you, people are fascinating. If you're ever bored, go out to the mall. Even Chatham Mall has a couple people in it. Um, I think Ben and Becca's store is the only reason that place exists anymore. Um, but watch people. And so we're sitting there. And Dan, I don't know if you remember this, but we were watching the soldiers, we're watching the officers, we're watching the workers, we're watching the people there, the taxi drivers. And they all, how they walked, Dan, do you remember? They had a bounce, they had a, a swagger to them. Everyone were like, <laughs> every one of them, it didn't, it didn't matter who they were, it was just like, I'm, I know I'm, I'm white, it doesn't work. <laughs> My rhythm's like, right? But there was a swagger. It was like, it didn't matter who they were. They, they were bouncing and bebopping, and it was just, you could tell that they were proud of whatever. They're just proud. I think sometimes we come to God's presence, and we have a swagger instead of a bow. And we're arrogant. And for some of us, we hear these things about who he is and what he does. It's a mystery. And we think that he should answer to us. Can I say something to you this morning in all kindness? If that's your attitude this morning, if you come into his presence instead of bowing but with swagger and you, you have him in a box or you, you dictate to him who he is, I would invite you to go to the book of Job. And Job says, God, what's happening is not right. And I demand of you an answer. I demand an audience with you. And so God says in chapter 38, says, okay, Job, you want an answer from me? You want an audience with me? Put on your big boy pants. Let's have a conversation. And the first question he asked Job is this. You ready, Job? Okay. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? If you can answer that, Please do. Right? And God goes on from there. And the point is, it's not the why or the what, it's the who. And he can be trusted. And for God's people this morning, when we come to this issue of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, can we not just say, Lord, thou knowest, and I will worship and bow before you because you are God. I know that doesn't slake your curiosity this morning, but we move on. We move on. We also see in this text the problem of sins of the flesh versus sins of the spirit. Um, if, if I were to name a character for you, and let's just do this this morning, okay? Let, this will be fun. If I name a character, I want you without thinking, without, without trying to, what's the right answer, just whatever comes out of your mouth first, I want you to say out loud, okay? So I'm going to name a character, and I want you just without thinking to say what sin comes to your mind. Are you ready? Pastor Dan. No, no, stop. Don't, don't, don't. Just, no. That wouldn't be fair for him. Wouldn't be fair for me. We won't do that. Let's do some people that won't be offended by this. Okay? Judas Iscariot. Yeah, right? I mean, Thomas. Louder, right? Um, David, adultery, murder, Bathsheba, right? And that's what comes to mind. And we all think that thought. And listen, David's sin, this fleshly sin of adultery, was wicked. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it was destructive for him, his family. He left a wake of disaster in his path. And we won't minimize that today. David paid for that. But do you know something? Here in, in 2 Samuel, as we have the story of David unfolding, we know of the sin of Bathsheba. But do you know 
that in 1 Chronicles, when David's life is revisited, that sin is not mentioned. And you would think that if you're telling David's story and you know of his big sin, which really gives the Bible authenticity, here is David, the man for Israel. I mean, he is their king. Everything rises and falls on him, and yet they, it's warts and all. They're not hiding anything. But you would think in, in 1 Chronicles 20, 21, at least, they would talk about Bathsheba. They don't. Do you know what sin is mentioned? Twice for David. Not the sin of Bathsheba, but the sin we find in 2 Samuel, verse number, well, the whole chapter, 1 through 25. And it's interesting to me. We look at the life of David, and here in the life of David, we're not told what the sin is. It doesn't say David knew it was a sin. But we do know this, that God had promised Israel when he said, listen, I will make you like the sand of the sea. I will make you like the stars in the sky. You'll be without number. That was God's promise. And here is David now, later in his reign, thinking, hmm, I wonder how big my army is. It would be nice to count them. And when he says this, of all people, Joab says, David, this is a really bad idea. Now listen, when Joab tells you this is a bad idea, this is a bad idea. Joab's not known for his moral integrity. This is a bad idea, David. And David heard it and knew it and did it anyways. And don't be so smug this morning. How many times in our life do we know of something that is wrong? We have been warned by the word of God, by the spirit of God, by the people of God. And we say, yeah, I know it's wrong, but I will lie. I will cheat. I will steal. I will look again. I will click that spot. And it's not just David that does these kind of things. It's humanity. And it was a willful act of rebellion, this sin. He had nine months to repent of it. He doesn't. So what's the egregious sin of David? Does anyone want to take a guess what this sin that's mentioned twice in David's life could possibly be? What's that? Unbelief, right? He didn't believe God's word, which would be also pride. Pride. God, I don't believe what you're saying. I know better. David's egregious sin here was a pride in his life, self-assertion. It is the mother of all sins. Listen to William Barclay. He says this. Pride is the ground in which all other sin grows and the parent from which all other sins come. Pride. Pride. And, And what we try to do is we try to categorize our sins. And we all think intuitively that the adultery of David, terrible. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, murder, right? Rape. And we go through the list. And what we do is this as believers. Those are bad. And they are bad. And those are bad sins. And at least I don't do this. And what we neglect are the sins of the heart and of the spirit that somehow in our lives we have made these things respectable. And we excuse them. And so when it comes to the inside lust and wickedness, our greed, our pettiness, um, our pride, we act as if it's not a big deal. And what I'm telling you this morning is, it is a big deal. David's pride, my pride, your pride is an affront to the living God. we got to quit categorizing these things. Not only that, when we live in our pride and our sins of the Spirit, it compromises the well-being of others. Listen to me this morning. Whether it's a sin of the flesh or sin of the spirit, when you and I sin, other people are always affected. Always. Hey, fathers and husbands this morning, let me tell you something. Your sin is going to impact your family. Moms, your sin is going to impact your children. Believer, your sin is going to impact someone else's life. You say, well, they don't even know about it. These guys didn't know about it. It grows. You must be careful. Look quickly at 2 
Corinthians chapter 7, just so that you know what I'm talking about this morning. It's going to come up on there. He says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. God's people this morning must be concerned with the sin of the flesh, which is obvious to us, and the not so obvious sins of the spirit. And what we need to do is do the Lord, the preacher, and everyone else a favor and just say, Lord, I am the man, I am the woman, and repent of these sins. The sins of the flesh are easy to put a finger on. Sins of the spirit more difficult for us, but not for God. Not for God. And here's the the main theme, the supreme lesson of our text this morning. Look at verse number 14, if you would. David says, at first he, he, choose, he chose to sin. And something interesting, God then allows him to choose a consequence. Dave, you sin. Now you get to pick your own consequence. Look what he says in verse number 14. And David said unto Gad, I'm in trouble. I'm between a rock and a hard place. Not sure what to do. Here's what I'm going to do. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord. For his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of men. Okay, I'm in trouble. I blew it. I've sinned before God. And now I have a choice on the consequence. And David does something very surprising. He says, I am going to, although I sinned against God, I'm going to fall into his hands because of his mercies. They are great. It's surprising, actually. It's very surprising. Um, I don't know if you remember this story, but um, years ago in a zoo outside of Chicago, there was a gorilla named Binti Jua. For those who care, it's Swahili. That means daughter of sunshine. You can use that sometime today. Binti Jua. She was a female gorilla. And there was an event that happened when a child fell into the sort of containment area, and this mother gorilla grabbed the child with a baby on her back, cradled the child, and then carried the child to the door where the gatekeepers come in so so that they could rescue the child, and that child fully recovered. Amazing. People were screaming and yelling, didn't know what was going on, and yet this gorilla went and took that child to the door to be rescued. They couldn't believe it. And you know what happened just a couple weeks ago, right? It was a month ago in Cincinnati. Um... What was the, the ape's name? I wrote it down because I'm not really good with ape names. But uh, Harambe, Harambe, male gorilla. Same deal happened. Uh, someone lost track of their kids, and we know it happens. You need to know where they're at, okay? But she lost track of her kid. The four-year-old fell down into this confinement area. And this time, a male gorilla grabbed the kid, 800 pounds. Now listen to me. If you, if you don't know this, A gorilla like that can can crush a coconut with one hand. Now, listen, I I, I want you to try this. Go to to the Sobeys and Superstore this week, grab a coconut, and try to crush it with one hand. Ian could do it, probably, but no one else. (laughs) He'll crush your skull. I mean, his hands are like... That's the strength of these animals. And again, people are screaming and, and going crazy. They call the a reaction team in, and this gorilla held on that child, knowing that any moment he, would, he could rip that child in pieces. And he decided to shoot the gorilla. To shoot him dead. You know, no darts, no, you know, to sort of, because if he flinched, it could be wrong. And they killed that gorilla on the spot. And if you're asking, since you're asking, was that the right call? Yes, it was the right call. I'm not for shooting apes. This, don't even accuse me. Oh, pastor, he loves shooting apes. That's not what I said. I'm not for shooting apes. I'm not for clubbing baby seals. I'm not for eating bald eagle eggs. I'm not for those things. I'm not. But I'll tell you what I am for, human life, all life. I know there's some animal lovers here. God bless you. I do love animals too. I love cow. (laughs) I do. I, I love cows. And pigs. I love pigs, too. Rib fest. I think it's a great thing. Right? Um, and, and I know animals are important, and I, and I, I don't begrudge you of that. I know that people love their animals, and that's, that's great. But listen to me. Animals were not created in the image of God. And it's not. And human life matters. It all matters. 
rich, poor, black, white, cop, criminal, disabled, elderly, unborn. All life matters. And so that thing, he had to go, man. Right call. Tragic, unfortunate, but the right call. And here's the deal. Why did they shoot that thing? Because kindness is not what is associated with a gorilla. What happened before was unusual. It was shocking that this female gorilla would take care of this child because that's not what we expect out of gorillas. We just don't. We expect them to be gorillas and rip things apart. And unfortunately, for, and I'm talking to believers, we as believers, when it comes to the God that we serve, we think of them, him this way, that mercy is the divine exception and not the true character of our God. We would never want to fall into his hands because we don't believe that this God is merciful. I want you to know something this morning. That is the furthest thing from the truth. Look with me, if you would, at Exodus chapter 34 this morning. And when people turn their pages, the the music sounds again. It's your second time, third time, we have to kill you. Okay? Okay. Exodus 34, look at verse number 6. The Lord is having, he's going to reveal himself to Moses. And think about this. The Lord could have said anything about his nature, his character, and who he is. But look what he says now in verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. This is God shouting to Moses. The Lord, Yahweh. The Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions for sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the sins of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation. Isn't it interesting that when God is going to reveal himself to mankind, the first thing he says is, I am the Lord, I am the Lord God, and I want you to know that I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands and forgiving iniquities and transgressions for sin. And I think too many of us as believers, you know, we, we glory in all these things. We glory in our wisdom, we glory in our power, we glory in our might and what we know. That's what God says, nothing stop that. You want to glory in something this morning? What does Jeremiah 9 say? Jeremiah 9, 23, 24, he says, don't glory in your riches, don't glory in your might, don't glory in your, in your power or wisdom, but glory in this, that he understands and knows me, who I really am. I am the God of heaven and earth. Do you know me? Do you understand me? And then he says, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things God delights. He delights in mercy and loving kindness and compassion for his people. And I want you to know this morning that in the disasters of, uh, and sins of life, there is no kinder place to fall than into the hands of the Lord. Hands of the Lord. Christian, when you blow it, and you will, the best place to fall the kindest place to fall is into the hands of our God. David was right. And sinner this morning without Christ, in your religion, in your good works, in your disdain for a judge and creator, the safest place for you to fall right now is into the merciful hands of a God who loved you and gave his son so that you could be spared the wrath which is to come and to be reconciled back to him. And if you don't fall into his hands for mercy and grace, there is coming a day when you will fall into the hands of the living God. And Hebrews makes it very clear. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But right now, he's extending to the lost mercy and grace. And to the believer, it's always there for us. It's always there. And David knew that the hand that strikes him would nevertheless, nevertheless spare him. Do you understand that? We fail, we blow it, we sin, 
And yet the hand that strikes and corrects us, right, the hand of God, he doesn't do it to destroy us. He does it to bring us back into fellowship with him. He spares us. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. This is our God. And now in closing this morning, look back at our text in 2 Samuel chapter 24. Look at the last verse of this chapter. Because God is a merciful God. He's a compassionate God. He's a God who is full of loving kindness, forgiveness, goodness, and truth. But I want you to know that this mercy flows because of sacrifice. Because of sacrifice. In verse 16, the wrath was stayed. Um, it was put on hold. But it still had to be satisfied. We use the word propitiation this morning. That God's wrath had to be satisfied. And God in his mercy restrains his wrath. And God in his mercy provides the way of removing wrath. And how does he do that? How does the God of heaven remove wrath from those who justly deserve wrath? He does it by way of an altar. Always by way of an altar. The wrath by his mercy was stayed, but in verse 25, David makes an offering there, a peace offering, a burnt offering. The innocent died, and the Lord was entreated for the land. Mercy flows because of sacrifice. Now this morning, I, I think you know and understand that the, uh, the blood of an animal could never atone for human sin. It was temporary. It was symbolic. And yet, in the New Testament, we find phrases like, through his blood, ransom, forgiveness of sin. And over and over again, the New Testament writers connect forgiveness with the blood of Christ and remind us that the release from sin and guilt come only through the propitiatory sacrifice of Christ. And this morning, we have an altar. Hebrews tells us Jesus was sanctified with his own blood for our sins. And when he died, the mercy gates were opened wide. There's a song that we sang this morning. I won't sing all of it. It really is one of my favorite songs. It's from the Welsh Revivals, Here is Love. And the second stanza says this. On the mount of crucifixion, fountains open deep and wide. Through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast, And gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above. Heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world with love. And my friend this morning, this is the heart of the heart of the gospel. That sinners need propitiation. They need the wrath taken away. It happens because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. We have mercy. And what I find amazing is that the last story of 2 Samuel makes us think about Calvary and the mercy of God. The sacrifice was made, and mercy, kindness, and compassion flowed. Mercy gripped David. So here's a question this morning as we close. Does mercy grip your life? Do you understand mercy? Do you understand the God that you serve, how he interacts, mercy, the sacrifice of Christ, Does that grip your heart and your life? Do you understand the gospel, what that means? Do you know something this morning? If you're a believer in Christ and you understand the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, um, it it critiques our own self-righteousness. We cannot be self-righteous or religiously proud when we know the gospel. Why? Because it's tis mercy all, immense and free. And oh my God, it found out me. When I understand the gospel and his mercy, it exposes our religious performance, our gifts, our intellect, our social standing. None of it matters. And so this morning, if you're sitting around here and you are are proud and you're arrogant about your self-righteousness and your religious experiences and your religious knowledge and all of that, I'm telling you, mercy has not gripped your heart. Because mercy understands I was a lost sinner. And I ran a hellbound race. And had it not been for the sacrifice of Christ, I would be lost today. Not in my own merits, my own works. Tis mercy all.
The gospel critiques our self-righteous. Number two, it's mercy gripped your life. Do you run to him and not away? Do you run to him and not away? The hand that smites you as a believer will spare you. And too many Christians, when they fall, when they blow it, you don't understand God's mercy. He calls us to come home. Don't, don't find your comfort somewhere else. Run back to him. It's the safest place you can land. Don't run to the arms of men. Run to God. His mercies are new every day. Has, has mercy gripped us? And finally, is that mercy extended to others? When you leave this place, are you and I so gripped by God's mercy, so blown away by his loving kindness, that we, that we, in a practical way, show it to others in our lives? Husbands, wives, do you show loving kindness and mercy to one another? It's amazing to me. There are men and women who are kind to everyone but their spouse. Can I tell you something? That is wicked. What's the purpose in that? Because you want someone to think that you're kind and compassionate and loving, and you're not? It starts at home. And when mercy grips our hearts, we see it in our relationships. We see it with our spouses, our children. We see it with other believers. And do you know something? This mercy that grips your heart, if it does, you cannot help but share it with other people. I'm just guessing this morning. But I'm guessing that everyone in this room knows somebody who's lost. One person? Do you know one person? What have we done to share the mercy that we were shown with others? David got it. Mercy gripped his heart. May we, by God's grace, see the God who is, understand his mercy, and let it captivate our hearts and lives. So much so that it knocks us down where we belong. We're not self-righteous. That when we fall, we run to him. And we can't help but let that ooze out of us to others. Let's have a word of prayer this morning.